Hello and uh, welcome. I'm Chris Cook. I'm one of the editors here at Tortoise. Uh, thanks ever so much for joining us for this evening's thinking on what is in London at least a beautiful day. So thank you very much for, for staying inside for us. Um, the topic tonight is how do we make sure that medical research benefits every community in the country, not just the biggest, loudest or richest. Um, it's it brought to you today in partnership with Genomics England. Um, the, this is a a difficult technical and ethical topic, but we've got people here who can really help us understand it. Um, just to go back one step, one of the, the just to explain the, the rubric for the evening, if you've not been to a thinking before, the idea of a thinking is, is a bit like a newspaper editorial meeting. Um, the idea is that rather than trying to have a sort of question time event where we ask a select panel, uh, what we really want to do is hear from you about your positions on this and your perspectives. Um, and uh, we really want to hear your discuss uh, to talk about this with you. If you have a look at the on your screen, you'll notice there is a text chat. My colleague Ella Hill is in the chat, and she will be um, she'll be pottering around there. If you want to raise your hand, there is a little raise hand uh, button somewhere on your screen, or perhaps uh, in your reactions um, toggle. Uh, if you want to take part, if you want to directly come to me to, to go on screen, you can raise hand there. Or if you say something interesting in the chat, we may come up and pester you to, to turn your camera on and say something, uh, share it with the rest of the class. So I think the, um, uh, the first thing to do really is to get cracking. So the, the question today is about how, uh, how we decide what gets researched first, how do you choose where we're focusing and how do we make sure that when we do the research we don't inadvertently leave out communities or people. Um, up first we're going to start with uh, Dr Richard Scott. Dr, is a, uh, Dr Scott is a, uh, uh, Rich I should say, is a consultant in clinical genetics at Great Ormond Street Hospital and an honorary senior lecturer at the, at the Institute for Child Health. He's also though the clinical lead for rare diseases at Genomics England. I'll very quickly explain who the other two people we've got here are, I should have done that first. We also have uh, Dr. Latha Chandramuli. Uh, she's involved in um, uh, the 100,000 Genome Project in the rare diseases category. And as the parent of a child with particular needs, she's very keen on promoting advocacy work, especially for children and family who are vulnerable and hard to reach. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Uh, I think Dr. Mavis Machirori, um, who is a senior researcher at the Ada Lovelace Institute. So, so Mavis is a... Um, is a is a guru on uh, inequality in data and how they interact uh, more broadly. But um, uh, yes, so I'm just going to start though. Back to Rich. Um, uh, I was hoping Rich, you could start off by just talking us through um, first of all a little bit about Genomics England and why Genomics England was keen to to have this conversation because Genomics England has partnered with us uh, to do it but also to think just to sort of, if you like, explain the question a little bit. Thanks, um, Chris. And it's really great to, to be here, as you say. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being inside, at least if you're in a, in a sunny place, part of uh, uh, the world like London is this evening. So we, um, we Genomics England, are, are um, an organisation that some of you might have heard of, but I'm aware that many of you won't. So we're a government owned company and we work in partnership with the NHS and with the researchers to, to support the use of genomics. So the study of our genomes, the DNA code that we, we all have within us to help um, patients in the NHS, people across the country, and also to support research and to make those two work together for, for patient benefit. And it, like in a sentence, our vision is a world where everyone benefits from genomic healthcare. Uh, and I think really important in that sentence is that word everyone that's right in the middle of it. And I think that's really sums up why we want to have this, this conversation. And I, I think we, we know, and, and we all you know, read the newspaper, see the news, there's a real sense of the potential of improvements in healthcare through genomics, but also other areas um, driven by research towards a more personalized, a more like tailored, um, uh, form of medicine that we'll all be receiving in the in the future, and that's fantastic. What we're also really aware of is that there's a real danger that those benefits that are all there ahead of all of us won't be evenly spread, and we have to think really carefully about 
that and, and how we minimize um, any inequality. Um, and I think for us, that means thinking about diversity in its broadest sense. Um, you know, people from different backgrounds in terms of their gender, their age, their ethnicity, in terms of the deprivation of the communities that they, they live in and so forth. And so we at Genomics England, or GEL, we often call ourselves GEL, um, I've started a concerted piece of work um, thinking about the diversity of our data and what we're supporting and how we're delivering on that, that vision where everyone gets those benefits. And I think the first step of that is this, this sort of conversation and engaging um, not just with clinical teams and with researchers, but also with communities to have a conversation about what it is we're all trying to achieve, what we're most concerned to address in terms of those, those potential pitfalls that we've had while sort of reaching for that really positive goal. And to start a conversation so that we can start thinking about how we prioritize which challenges we want to address, how we might address them and you know in what order. How, for example, you know, maybe building particular tailored analytical tools that, that work for all communities, um, address certain problems, or to address some of the historical biases that in certainly in, in research, but in general, but in genomics too, um, there have been where certain communities have um, been included in research more than others. So the, the answers, if you like, are biased also. And I just to give you, I'll give you two examples um, of areas that we're thinking about this in that I think will hopefully give you a bit of a flavor of the sorts of um, discussion we want to have and the sorts of things that we're, we're facing into. Um, so the first is that the for the last year, we genomics have been running a program on COVID um, with some researchers um, across the country, um, really trying to answer the question, what are the genetic factors that influence what someone's risk of get, becoming critically ill with COVID. And to do that, we've recruited nearly 15,000 people now who've been on intensive care with COVID. Um, and we're also recruiting, a, um, have recruited a similar number of people who've had COVID, but more mildly. And to do that and to do that well, what we've needed to do is engage really deeply with communities across the country to make sure that those two groups, as we recruit them, match each other as closely as possible in terms of those same sorts of factors, gender, ethnicity, age, the deprivation of the communities that they're coming from. Because we know all of those factors are important to sort of control for so that we don't make false assumptions. For example, in COVID, as it stands, we actually don't see evidence that there are differences that are driven by the genetics that are linked to ethnicity. Um, we th the evidence we see at the moment is that there are other factors that are structurally linked through other societal factors that are driving those differences we see. Um, so that, and that's really important to not make false assumptions. It's also important that we get that matching, if you like, and, and so that the answers we do generate are relevant for all communities, if not just relevant for some. And then my second example, uh, is an example from my own NHS practice. So I also work at Great Ormond Street where I see kids who have suspected rare genetic disease. That's the sort of genetic disease where there's one spelling difference in their whole genome, the whole three billion letters of their DNA code, which has mean that they've been born with a rare genetic condition that has caused the major health problems. Um, and this year, um, the NHS will be rolling out the use of whole genome sequencing, so reading that full code um, to help diagnose children and families with those sorts of conditions. And we at Genomics England are working in partnership with them, delivering the sequencing bit and the, some of the, and the technology that supports the NHS teams. Um, so when I sit in clinic and see a family with a rare disease, um, when I, I can struggle and the our teams in the NHS can struggle in children from non-European ancestry more than those from a European um, background because we just don't have the representation in the data sets that the lab teams are looking at to be able to tease apart what is a, the cause of their condition, a rare genetic variant that's been the cause of this condition versus one which is you know, uncommon or even sometimes quite common in their community that, that we just don't have enough people in our reference data sets to, to spot. So that makes a real difference. So as I say, they're just like two illustrative examples. There are many more, 
um, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of them this evening. And as medicine gets more intelligent and more tailored, I think you know we need to accept we have to work harder to make sure that those benefits are there for, for everyone. And along the way, there'll, there'll be lots of hard choices, lots of really difficult conversations to have. And I think what we're keen to do as you know, and this evening being part of that is to be part of that conversation. Can I, so Rich, thanks, that's very clear. Thank you ever so much. There's one, there's one idea I was hoping I could get you to, to explain in brief, just to help get it straight in everyone's head, which is a word that might come up, which is stratification. So the idea that, um, forgive me if my history degree hasn't equipped me to fully explain this properly, the idea that in effect, um, that uh, we'll get ever more tailored, in this context, ever more tailored treatments potentially based on some genetic predisposition that you might have. So I might get, we, you and I might have the same, present with the same cancer to a hospital, but actually the drug that we write would be different for me to you potentially because of something in my genome that you don't have. That's right. So I guess stratification in, is a word that means sort of grouping into different, um, um, different smaller um, uh, individual groups. So, so historically, medicine was very sort of broad brush, very blunderbuss. Um, you know, you have, um, uh, you've, you're, you're suffering from um, uh, a heart attack. Therefore, you will get the, the standard array of medicines, whatever your age, uh, all of the other factors. And what we increasingly realize not just in the sort of world I, I've described of these very rare conditions where people have very particular conditions and they're, they're a, a small group of patients, but actually all of us differ in many, many ways. Some of that's, for example, potentially because of genetic differences between us, even between different people in the same family, but it's also multiple other factors, our, our age, our gender, et cetera, et cetera. And as, as healthcare, as, as our knowledge improves, we're getting better at grouping people into groups where we have better knowledge. So we might know that a particular drug, for example, is effective in 60% of people overall, and has, but has a nasty side effect. If we could only know upfront who that 60% of people are, wouldn't it be wonderful to save the other 40% the risk of the side effects? Super, thanks ever so much. Um, Lutha, I was wondering if I could come to you next. Um, the, um, I mean, your 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 sort of experience. Um, you're both a doctor and the mother of doctors, and um, uh, the um, your um, your personal experience actually speaks to this problem. This this sort of issue of representation and making sure we have a broad enough data set. Oh, hang on, you're muted. We'll just give us a second. We'll. Hang on, this is, there we are. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, thank you, Chris, uh, for inviting me to be part of this today. And thank you, audience, for actually contributing and hopefully enriching the discussion. So just to give a bit of perspective, and just to, you've already introduced me, but mainly my, my background is I'm a clinician. So I, I am a community pediatrician. So I work with families and children, and young people and I'm based in Bristol. So I work with a social enterprise and one of the largest of its kind in UK where there is access to children and young people and adult services. I'm also, as Chris said, I'm a parent of twins and both of them are in first year medicine this year. But we had, we've had difficult journeys as, um, as, a, as a family and um, individually and various other members of the family. We've all been through our own personal experiences which brings a whole different perspective when you're on the other side of the consultation table. And actually that informs practice, that informs uh, you know, uh, what are the positives in our health service, what are the scope for areas of improvement, research ideas, unmet needs, and of course, praise for NHS as a team. So, and, uh, and the various other members of the public who have helped us at times. You know? So I think that's how I come. I'm also, um, well, I've recruited people for research. We've been part of the 100,000 Genome Project as a family. And I've also, I'm a tutor teacher. I'm, as Rich mentioned about the COVID, yes, I'm part of um, the COVID vaccination front and um, constantly look up things about what can we do to make things better. See the second wave in India involved as part of that, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a genuine campaign to improve promotion improve awareness 
and, and that generally comes with the whole principles of wider participation. So just to give you an idea about our participant panel, we've been in, in post for about five years now, a group of very, very proactive uh, participants who have shared their uh, personal stories, which has helped change practice. And indeed they are, I mean, we as a group uh, link in with uh, access review committees, ethics committee, where we look at what, which bits of the information that we have can be accessed and used for research. We probe, we challenge, we are curious, we question. We, are, we, we ask questions about how our data is shared and held because we truly believe that we are the ambassadors and would like wider participation. So the more wider the participation, the more inclusive, and as Rich alluded, to stratification. I think, yes, the world is heading to a genomics uh, world, uh, which will help in personalizing and in, in, in targeting practice. And you may have heard about the recent news about gene therapy targeting spinal muscular atrophy. So yes, it does help. And we've also sometimes do not have all answers and, and that's okay. But I, I, I think that's how we got recruited in. We do not have answers, but that's all right. But the point is you are still there to give hope to others if you do not have answers. And I think that's the whole principle. So it's the interface, in my opinion, I feel it's engaging as widely as possible, especially for the hard to reach families and the hard to reach public, uh, who are probably the most vulnerable and the ones who are probably, and it's unconscious bias on many occasions because people who are at the forefront who want to be involved in research are probably the ones who are already participating. And, and it's trying to think creatively with curiosity, how do we engage those people who actually have a lot to say and who improve the diverse uh, group of sampling, which as you know, the diverse, the bigger the sample, your robust data you get, and that's better you know, in terms of quality assurance. Um, and for me, I think it's important that we have good lines of communication. So yes, science feels very haloed and very siloed. We need to break those barriers. And the moment we break those barriers and improve communication and actually share personal stories, and it's a friends and family test at each level, isn't it? So if, you, if you, people realize you've been through those journeys, mix the researchers and general public and scientists and various groups of people. So there's open and two-way conversation. In fact, not just two-way, multiple level conversation. That improves communication and that improves, um, well, empowers and helps people to engage. And that's true for any aspect of care. So I, I am a firm believer in promoting advocacy, capturing the voices, and above all, I guess, it's making each contact count. So just make sure that each time you meet someone, you are offering that word of wisdom. That could be clinical, that could be research, it could be any, any kind of format. So I think that's my hat, various different hats. <laughs> the, uh, thanks ever so much. I wonder if we go to, to Mavis. Um, Mavis, your, your research and expertise is, is um, you're, you're basically in a Lovelace Institute which I guess sort of speaks to that this is a this is not just the sort of healthcare issue the th thing we're talking about the importance of having coverage in your data sets um, is you know is, is a much broader one um, but actually there there are also some specific difficulties here around race as well and about our language and how we talk about it I was wondering if you could just basically tell me how bad are things generally and 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 what are the what are the things we need to be Sort of have in mind about all this. Thank you. Um, so it's it's a difficult question to answer. My gut feeling is that they are bad, but that they could get worse, but they could get better. Right? It depends on how we approach um, kind of the moment that we're in. I mean, obviously, like at the Ada, um, we want to work to understand how um, data and technologies can, for example, um, exacerbate inequalities, but how they can also work for society making sure that you know, data and technology works for everybody. Um, and when you think about medical research and um, genomic research, for instance, there's certain areas where I think we have to acknowledge kind of the racialization of people, the ways in which categorization happens that actually sometimes doesn't map at all onto the way people experience the categories. Um, and understand that we cannot divorce research from social experiences of everyday life um, for instance, if women are, you know, marginalized in one area of society, or if people 
who are classified or racialized as ethnic minorities are not enjoying the benefits of full citizenship in a country, how can we expect them to participate in research and say that that research is going to benefit them? So I think when we think about you know, um, research and participation, one of the things that we need to do is really take a, a wider lens approach and say, how can we make sure that our practices also speak to the social injustices that people are already experiencing? Because if we take research as a silo, then what will happen is we're only going to exacerbate some of those and an example would be for um, the use of data, right? Um, we've got existing data sets, but if you look at them without understanding the context in which that data was collected or the history on the political times in which that data was collected, then sometimes the insights that you generate from it are actually not, not correct, they're biased. And what you end up doing, if you're using machine learning or AI, for instance, to train of prediction models, then what you're doing is actually just exacerbating that. So uncritically taking um, data sets and you know, researching that without then mapping onto the social experiences that we have of, the, you know, of that data is only going to exacerbate um, some of these problems of you know, categorization and representation. Um, and one of the things that I think genomics especially has a difficult task and I don't know how like how the answer goes is this issue of um, mapping on social categories with genomic information or DNA or genetics but actually sometimes the biology um, is not because of the category but it's because you know it's the biology but then it is impacted by the ways in which society then is structured and there's a way that we need to and like unpack that so that we're not saying that the genetics that we see or the genomic um, predictions that we make are exactly matched onto ethnic or you know racialized categories because those are social um, constructs in themselves. So, so could you could you give me an example? I mean, could you give me an example of that last thought? So you, the um, um, I just just to sort of it's quite um, it's quite a lot going on there. <laughs> <laughs> there is, isn't there? Okay, so let's take, for instance, um, one of, I guess, one of uh, history's most contentious um, categorization of Black people. Um, take, for example, Black people in the States or in the UK and sickle cell disease. So you hear a lot about sickle cell disease as a Black person's disease, but actually that isn't true. It is a genetic disease. Um, it, ten it tends to be more prevalent in certain areas in Africa, um, in South, uh, South Asians and Mediterranean. But to classify it as a Black disease has actually meant that research funding has not been channeled to um, sickle cell disease. And one of the um, other genetic conditions that is usually used as a comparator is cystic fibrosis, which also can happen to anyone because it's a genetic disease but most usually is found in Northern European countries. Um, and there's been research recently that showed um, in the US, for instance, that um, drugs, I think the FDA approved drugs for cystic fibrosis at a rate of four times more than for sickle cell disease. And then you consider that sickle cell disease then had a, a stigma in the US that people sometimes couldn't get jobs. Um, so when we start to then think about well, what do we mean by categorizing people as black or you know the diseases that we think only belong to these um, these ethnic groups, how does that change the ways in which we frame the questions, the ways in which we add funding to understand what was going on for actually for conditions that are quite common? I don't know if that sort of gets to oh, there. I see, I see. That, that's very helpful. Um, Rich, I was wondering if I could come back to you. I feel like there's a sort of, we, Mavis and Lath have set out sort of two sort of, well, policy challenges there around, um, around making sure that the, the data sets that you have don't lead you, basically, to answer the begging the questions that you're trying to answer, you know, that they don't exclude the people that actually give you the discontinuity you need to see, the, to see what's going on. Um, do you, I mean, do you think there's a, I was struck that the slides that we had at the very beginning um, when the music was playing, that the one of the statistics in there was that, that white people are 87% more likely to 
to participate in a clinical trial than a than a, a person from an ethnic minority in the UK. And I, I think there's a, um, these threads all sort of run together, right? The prioritization of, um, if I can paraphrase Mavis's, Mavis's attempt to not use these words, but white and black diseases, right? The, the over-indexing of, of white people in, in well, uh, in, uh, in UK research. How, like these things all cluster together. It's sort of, it's research topic plus research panel. That's right. I, I'm, I think, as Mavis has said, you know, there, there aren't easy answers here. And I think, you know, one of the really important things, I think, is to sort of try to unpick, A, some of the, some of the sort of confounding sort of common practices or co things that are happening. And so I think, you know, Mavis's example of, of sort of the, 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 the context in which people are recruited to research studies and data is collected, uh, sort of being aware of those, but also then thinking really carefully about the things that we're trying to counteract in terms of the outcomes, because um, a lot, of, and, and particularly, I guess, in terms of our focus, you know, we're very focused on the, you know, outcomes in terms of equality of benefits to um, patients in healthcare. And I think, I think sometimes, I think that will help us in many cases. So in your clinical trials case, I think we have to set out at the beginning what our bar is, what we're shooting for. And to say, for example, we want this level of confidence in terms of the effect of this um, intervention in the following groups. Um, and to think, therefore, what, um, what it is we need to do to achieve that. We might be wrong because we will made some wrong assumptions. But for example, I think one really key um, concept here is being representative is often not enough. And I think being really clear about that and, and also, to be honest, I mean, being honest about when we, we need to sort of, you know, when we need to be able to say that we won't be clear and, and we are currently in a, not in a position to deliver um, answers for all, all groups, like just being upfront about that. So that we um, so that we can think together about which battles it is we're going to fight in what order to 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 to, to work against them. So I mean, this is in some senses it's actually this is a, some of these things are political questions in the sort of truest sense of that word. That they are which groups of people should we be more worried about than others, and uh, and actually it's also um, our forefathers and foremothers. Um, uh, did research into diseases A, B, and C and left diseases P, Q, and R alone. It's a political decision to decide that now we need to address the balance because it particularly affects one, one group of people. And actually, could you, I mean, I'm sort of intrigued about the idea that we might end up with conversations where we think there's low hanging fruit in one area of research and we can plow on, but actually we're quite good at that stuff. And conversely, there's an area over here which is quite tough but there's no treatment. Like this week, the, the FDA approved a drug that everyone thinks shouldn't be approved for Alzheimer's because basically there's nothing else. Um, is that, I mean, is that the way, we, is that the, the, another ethical question that we've got to sort of worry about? Sorry, I, I ended up on mute. Yes, absolutely. And I think, I think we're, we're not at a loss for ethical and difficult <laughs> decisions. In this area, I think I think that's the thing, and and I think, um, yeah. So so, absolutely, and I think there's a there's a sort of twin danger. There's a danger of not getting stuck in and sort of solving some problems which are low hanging fruit, and also not of stepping back at the same time far enough so that we can actually address some really sort of structural um, issues that will stop us delivering in five, 10 years time. You know, if, if we don't um, do X now, we won't be in a position of five or 10 years time to do something. We need to be thinking in that sense at the same time as actually saying, for example, in, in sickle cell, um, to Mavis's example, you know, that, that's a, you know, that there, is, there are clear things that one can do by focusing in, in under-researched areas or, identifying you know even just you know 
relatively um, simple sort of analytical tools we might de develop to counteract some of the some of the inequities we currently um, see in healthcare. Sorry, thanks so much. I don't know if we come to Lapa next, actually, just because I think there's so you're you you've been very clear about the importance of advocacy and of and um, and representation. Rich made the point there that um, about the representation doesn't necessarily um, mean what you think it does. Um, I mean the the let me let me torture you slightly by asking you a sort of ridiculous hypothetical, which is in a sense, which is the most important representation? Um, what is, if you could flick a switch and fix one thing tomorrow, what would that, what would that be? What, what would you, where would you go? It always comes down to individual perspectives, isn't it? So what really is close to somebody's heart may not necessarily be close to someone else. And I think it comes down to what is the best interest and, 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 and also not just as an individual, but for, for a group, because as Rich pointed out, and I think you alluded to as well, is that it comes down to um, whether you dilute research by, by spreading yourself and spreading the funding to do multiple research when you could potentially keep cracking at one domain and perhaps even reach a, co a cure or something, or whether you say, well, we've done that good enough, let's now migrate to other areas because there are other people who need to benefit. And that's where it's not an individual decision. It's got to be done through consultation. It's got to be done through patient focused groups, et cetera. And then also uh, it's a question of how do you enrich and empower people to participate? The more you involve people in these communications and dialogues, it's only then you will know that actually that is a problem we weren't aware of. That is something that we could do something about, even if it's not a full cure, it is going to help. Sorry. Can I ask you? Can I ask you for like a, for a sort of firm example on that? Is there something that you see where you think, you know what, this is nuts? Where why have we why have I got ninety six options? You know why are there four hundred statins and and there's no one has yet even touched X, Y, or Z, which is yeah. prevalent in this community. Well, you I mean you I you sh you mentioned about elderly population where they're not much researched into. You've got. Uh, women and reproductive medicine, etc., which is an area my, my husband is into reproductive medicine. And I know that's a huge area that could be really developed and it has got huge impact on families, on emotional health of people. Um, and that could be researched into, but it's always perceived as it's not well as life threatening as cancer or cardiac. And that's just not for research though. It, it is almost all aspects of healthcare is how its funding streams are allocated. And I think that's where we fundamentally need to start thinking, um, uh, how do we prioritize? Can we involve more people in these discussions um, and the ethics of these discussions? Because it's a social responsibility and I guess a de degree of unconscious bias always comes into all of these. Can I, can I ask if there, if there was, if you, someone came to said, or someone, let's say someone from, a, from an ethnic minority background came to you and said, I and all my family have this disease, um, I don't think it's adequate research into it. Would you have a, if you were think, oh, actually, you know what, you're right, we need to sort of pull the levers, we need to try and encourage research into this. Would you have a good idea about, as a frontline clinician, about the levers to pull to sort of try and get, you know, the, the medical research boards to start pushing money that way? You know, do you have a sort of, I'm just wondering from where you sit, is there a sort of, is there an obvious consultation process down to you? And to be very honest, uh, uh, Chris, it's it's mostly what tends to happen is we we are we are in Bristol very fortunate to be linked up with our tertiary and quaternary clinicians. So like like Rich, we've got our lovely uh, clinical geneticist teams as well. So we would link in with them, and and we'd be quite a lot guided by them in terms of this is an area which you know. And the more you flag up, we have lots of peer review, we have lots of discussions amongst various teams. Uh, where we do share impact of family, the impact of the health needs and how it's affecting not just one person, but a number of groups of, fam of, of people in, within that family, for example. And I think those are the ones which we bring in for case discussions, which helps us, um, which helps elevate, you know, what, what kind of tests, for example, needs to be offered. I mean, that's, as Rich will confirm, that that has itself evolved with time from offering baseline tests to more widespread testing and that has led to a huge, um, what I would call, um, um, informed practice uh, on how we should be, how we should be focusing on investigations, and that leads then to how we should be managing. 
So yes, as a clinician, I have got roots, fortunately, because I'm within a very good tertiary contact system. But there are lots of clinicians who are based in um, district general hospitals in slightly more remote areas who do have access, but it may not always be consistent. And, and that boils down to the same principles of resources and time and capacity within other teams. So you might recruit a person and then into a trial or into a treatment group or into an investigation. And then you don't hear from anybody for weeks, months, years. And then finally you might get a letter through the door. And that's not the way these things should be done. If you want people to be involved, it's got to be better support through the process. Um, and that's just, you know, a comment, but there are lots of areas where lots of positive things are done, you know, where, where there are examples of good practice where we should probably then decide how can we cascade this elsewhere. And, and you, I think Mavis mentioned about social responsibility, and I completely agree, you know, I mean, taking the example of COVID and, and how it impacted different waves in different countries, and, and COVID is a big example of how we've managed to see the health and social inequalities emerge and how that has impacted not just our country, but across the globe. And that's why it's a pandemic. And if we start focusing on one, then the other will dip. And that's the seesaw effect, isn't it? So unless we try and improve and try and um, hopefully spread things around, otherwise it will not get a level, isn't it? So I think there's no right or wrong answer to that very tricky question, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> um... I mean, that's not what we want. We want simple, straightforward answers that we can do in a week. Um, yeah, can we can we go to Caroline Cake, please? Caroline is um, the. Let me get your title right, Caroline. You're the CEO of the Health Data Research UK. Um, the um, I'm just wondering. That, so you've made a a few points in the in the chat. Um, the I mean what. I mean, like the, 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 your concern is actually that, that we're maybe the um, worries about data sensitivity and, and you know, the, the delays to the GP data stuff being rolled out might mean that actually some of these questions are harder to answer. Yes, um, thanks, Chris. I mean, it's been a fascinating conversation listening in um, here so far and, and so many of those aspects and um, incredibly important research how how I think the, the, the kind of my question my, my kind of point was around actually the the importance of using GP data to understand and to identify different groups from different communities to participate in clinical trials to be able to understand and follow up on um, on particularly in diseases or illnesses that perhaps aren't um, in in um, so present in the kind of secondary care setting or, ca or capturing things at earlier stages. So you can actually really understand um, diseases at early stages. You can understand linkages with different aspects. You can then actually look through um, uh, um, afterwards. So for example, during COVID, looking at the long-term COVID um, effects by following people in um, understanding what's happening in the, um, in the GP setting. So all of these really incredibly important pieces of research um, that, and, and potentially important breakthroughs, how do we ensure that um, the kind of people remain engaged and wanting their data to be used for these purposes and 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 in terms of particularly given the kind of the, the political dimensions and things associated with um, what's happened with GP data debates over the last few days I think in just in terms of how do we keep making this case so people recognize how important it is for people to be engaged so that they do benefit from from the um, this really important research and are not left out because they're not represented in the data Can I I mean, your, the, the, your institution um, is a sort of um, overarching institution for research in, in, um, in the UK. One of Paul Dinsdale asks about the interface of the farm industry. But one of my questions that asked him was partly to sort of get to this question about how we prioritize what we research. And one of my, um, and one of the, you, I hadn't really thought of this at all before, actually, the idea that if you don't have the access to the primary care data, you won't see patterns about uh, issues of concern that we need to research. Um, but actually, one of the one of the sort of one of my, I guess, the subtext of my question was really who is making the decisions about what to research? Where is that? Where are those calls being made in practice? Um, I'm a really fascinating question in terms of uh, well, there are there are aspects within um, UKRI, the kind of big research funders, the charities. Um, have their kind of strategic plans and where they're looking to invest in. 
But there's also an element of actually, I mean, I know that when we've been involved in, in different aspects on there, it's also back from the research community themselves. Um, so, for example, we've held um, what are called calls, which is basically where you can invite people to, to respond for various aspects and different communities respond back to be able to answer the questions. And that those questions sometimes are, are very topic specific. So they might be about dementia or might be about cardiovascular disease, but sometimes they're more functional. So, for example, we've done calls around data uses and things. In those examples, you get different communities respond back. So there are there are opportunities um, in terms of how, how funding is set up that the kind of effectively you could have communities responding much more proactively back. There then are actually the research itself is sometimes identifying groups that are underrepresented and need, need more work and things going into them. So I think there's many, many layers in which these kind of decisions and things and, and different activities cluster. There's also important clustering around charities. So the big charity funders, so if you get them, um, you're, you're kind of working in cardiovascular or cancer, you've got very big established charities who are investing in making those that sort of activity happen. So you, and you see a kind of clustering effect around those sorts of activities. So th there are lots of different ways in which this is playing out. Can we, can, we, can we go back to Mavis? So I think there's a, I mean, I think the, the um, I think there's a, uh, sorry, my internet is playing up slightly. There, I think there's a really interesting question about, about um, what representativeness needs. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit to the politics of it really, because I think there's a, there's a danger, isn't there, in us um, uh, I would, I, I, being basically too coy to talk about some of this stuff, right? Like it's, um, is that, do you know what I mean? Like the, the um, we're gonna have to have quite difficult conversations about some of this stuff. And I, I it's sort of, in a sense, it's sort of, um, I don't wanna say Lafa's doing the easy stuff because she isn't, but the, the um, but more that like, what, in a sense, representing your own patients is kind of easy. When you're at the middle deciding what the, yeah. whether you've got enough, whether you need more of this, that's kind of where the hard stuff is, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I guess in a, in a, place where you've got limited resources, you have to make these difficult choices, right? But one of the things that we're questioning is, well, you know, you ask what do you mean by representation? Is it representation of patients? Is it representation of experiences? Because there's something about if you try and, and get a maximum understanding and representation of what, how people experience healthcare, then sometimes actually you can target based on those experiences and and the ways in which um, people are not then benefiting from research. One of the things that this um, could lead to is understanding missing data and how missing data is accounted for. So there's um, the Inclusive Data Task Force that's really driving, um, like getting us to think about what do we mean when we use certain data sets, who's, you know, who is represented, who's the missing voice. And again, going back to something I said earlier is, um, how does this map onto people's experiences, right? So um, when I was um, still in uni a few years ago, I spoke to people who had had um, family histories of cancer and they were coming to genetics clinics and kind of the, the prevailing discourse around minority populations is they're not interested and they're hard to reach but actually when we spoke to women, a lot of them had gone to their GP numerous times with these concerns and they were dismissed. So sometimes it's not about what's in the data, it's what's, what's not in the data. And when you start to look at genomic um, research, actually the mutations, for example, in the breast cancer gene, BRCA1 and 2, black women actually then come, we already know that they, they um, come to a &E with late stage cancer. Um, cancers that are more difficult to treat. But genomics wise, they have higher rates of what's called variants of unknown significance. So people are participating, but they're not even getting any kind of meaningful information from that. But to um, Caroline's point, we do need people to then put, like deposit their data so that this can be analyzed. We have to ask hey, well, hey, Yeah. Hey, could you go back just, just, just again for the benefit of this history degree? guy here right they just um just on the on the on the thought on on the breast cancer just to explain that again just slightly more slowly for my benefit okay so i'll try and hopefully rich will come in if i say um anything that's <laughs> not very correct um so we have um breast cancer one and breast cancer two as kind of the, the 
genes that are most um, likely to cause um, breast cancer. Um, general literature tells us that the rate at which these mutations occur is um, about one in 800. Um, depending on how you're classified, so women from a Jewish background um, have a higher rate, so they're more likely to have these um, mutations that cause breast cancer. Um, and for years, it seemed that black women just had a, a similar rate as the general population of like one in 800. But um, research in the States actually showed that the rate in mutations was actually higher for black women, higher than thought, almost as close to 400, between 200 and 400. But then this is not actually showing up. So what then tends to happen is the panels that we use for saying the range of normal, not normal, or um, mutations or not mutations, using very non-technical terms here. Um, if we don't have that representative um, database, then sometimes we don't actually know if the results that we're giving is normal for this group of people or not. So we then say to people, oh yes, we've got your genetic result, but actually doesn't really tell us anything about why you've had this cancer or don't have this cancer. Um, so then this means that we need more um, different people, people of different backgrounds to participate in research. But the question then becomes, why aren't people taking part? So when we think about this current um, issue of the GPPPR, why don't people want their data shared? And there's something fundamental about the ways in which um, there's both a surveillance of society, there's there are these power imbalances that mean people actually are reluctant to have um, third parties or people they don't trust accessing their data because in other social situations, data has been misused. That's okay. So one, one of the things that uh, sort of 10 years ago, one of the things that people used to say about the NHS was one of, our, one of the problems with the NHS is that Polish people have started turning up and they don't know how to use GPs and they all go to A&E. <laughs> um, so I get, I mean, there are also, um, I think that was that was that was like a tiny amount of truth in that. But there's but it, but the differential behaviors between communities um, could actually end up causing trouble here as well, right? So the if people aren't turning up until they're sick at an A and E, or they or they don't basically don't have a primary care data record at all, um, we might just we might end up with with a basically a lousy data set. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's like everything. It's complex, right? It's if you keep going to your GP, and for many different reasons. I mean, GPs are amazing. They are also understaffed, and if you can't get an appointment, for instance, you're going to go to A and E because that's kind of your next best step. Um, if you go to to see a healthcare professional and tell them I have a family history of this but actually that family history isn't documented because perhaps the family doesn't live in the same country, then sometimes that doesn't really get taken up because we don't really have the data to collaborate what you're saying. So there's something about listening to patients, listening to their experiences, they're not always going by what's written or what is you know, kind of the average because a lot of people's experiences are, are going to be very different from the average. So how do we bring that into understanding the ways in which data is created and curated and then you know, used onwards to understand what's going on in people's health. Thanks ever so much, uh, ladies. Um, I wonder if we could go to Andrew Girdwood, who has been Hi. in the chat. Uh, so Andrew, the, so you, you described the experience of being, being basically pa panelized. You've been, you've been brought into the, um, you've been recruited to a, being recruited to a study. Well, well, that's right. I mean, I was very lucky when I fell ill because I guess, you know, a white male, I was taken very seriously from, from the outset. And it took, it took ages for a diagnosis. And I have, I have a rare disease or actually more specifically a rare syndrome, which is a complication because that presumably means there might be multiple diseases. People in my group might have slightly different conditions. Um, I, I'm also on a biosimilar to treat it, which has been very effective. But the, that then overlap with people in my rare condition and on a biosimilar is, is, is small. And, and so research is really needed because they want to know, does it work? Is it cost effective? As a biosimilar, the NHS can save a lot of money if they don't have to shell out on the, the, the branded drug. Yes. 
just for obviously I know, but can you just explain what a biosimilar is for the benefit of other people with history degrees? Um, so we're talking about biological medicine here. So we're back in that personalized space um, and the pharmaceuticals will invent something. I hope I'm getting this right, by the way. I'm not going to be a medical professional. Uh, they'll, they'll invent, you know, they'll, they will do the heavy lifting. They will, they will invest lots and lots of money in speculation that they will, they'll, they'll solve a problem and they'll try and recoup that money uh, by selling the drug at a premium. Uh, later, someone can then copy the drug, the effectiveness of it. Uh, and my understanding is in the biological space, trying to copy it right, you end up with a biosimilar. So a, a cheaper version, a non-branded version of a, of, for my case, life-transforming uh, treatment. But I, 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 on, on, the, on the data collection, my, my anecdote was, I mean, I was sitting in the hospital. This is probably the day I finally got the diagnosis and I was been introduced to my my sort of my my injection routine, the least charismatic, but I one of my fondest memories was I, I was approached by a researcher. He, even from their body language, we're, we're, we're downbeat, we're broken, we're defeated. Uh, somebody approached me, expected me to tell them to go away, and what they wanted was my permission for the data they collect to go into the trial so they can see what is doing to my blood. I mean, I have I get blood tests regularly. And I, I said, yes, because of course I'm a data guy, I want to help. It seems like the very least I could do after you know, 10, 10 years of battling what, with the NHS to figure out what was wrong. And I could just tell from their reaction that they hear the word yes from patients. I, I don't know, hardly ever. But just to follow up something that I may have said, I've never heard what happens next. I mean, I don't think I need to, but I would, you know, I work with charities. And one of the things that we do with charities that really keeps people engaged and spread word of mouth is, show the results of your donations. And I, I, wonder, I, just, I wonder if my experience, you know, don't start off assuming that patients are gonna say no. You know, summon up a little bit of hope, get, get people on board. Okay, the, I mean, the, and, the, and the process after that has been, has been good, right? Like the- Well, the... yes, but here's another curveball to throw at you. Um, COVID is reckless because I have not had the same regular sampling and testing during the lockdown as I had previously. So I, I for their part, I now fear, is there a gap in the data? What does that do to the study? How, is there, what, how much of a setback is it? I mean, I'm still getting the blood test, so I get that from the GP, but that's, you know, it's, it's a different tier, it's just a couple of tubes. That's, I mean, I guess there's, a, there's an old thing about how the most studied humans on earth, but I just haven't made a joke about it in the, in the chat. There's no joke about how the most studied humans on earth are American psychology students who get <laughs> through everything. And there's like a, you do, you know, that I guess maintaining representation is going to be important, is important rather, in um, the people with precarious jobs who are less likely to be able to attend research appointments and that kind of thing are, or people whose healthcare is more likely to, to go awry and therefore less likely to have a good, you know, regular time series data set. Um, Thanks ever so much, Andrew. I wonder if we come to my to my colleague Blitz, um, who has been talking about her um, experience over the last gosh, how many years? Uh, sort of eighteen months, two years. Um, yeah, two years. Yeah. Um, the um, so um, you have BRCA two. Yes, yeah, so I have BRCA two, and also a lesser known mutation um, called ATM. Uh, which unfortunately does not dispense any cash to me. So um, there are nine mutations. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm repeating this correctly. I believe there are nine mutations that we know about that are linked to breast cancer. And um, so I, my health insurance company would pay to test for BRCA1 and BRCA2, but to test for the full suite, I had to pay extra, which is also a thing that we should consider um and and from that I, I found out that I had this mutation um and it drastically changed my treatment plan so literally overnight I'd gone from having or needing a lumpectomy and three months of radiotherapy to double mastectomy double oophorectomy um, six months of chemotherapy plus 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 and 10, 10 years of tamoxifen plus it's left me infertile so literally overnight it changed but how lucky am I that I'm living in this age whereby that test meant that 
I had six months of chemotherapy rather than two years of chemotherapy, or that we were even able to identify that um, with ACM, actually, it's really interesting that if you have radiation or too much radiation, it, it has the opposite effect on cancer. So it grows your cancer rather than killing your cancer. So again, if we hadn't tested for that and I'd gone ahead with three months of radiotherapy, potentially I could have been growing mm. the cancer, which is just, it's just so fascinating. Can I, can but, I, ask, can I ask Chris about, I mean, I guess that's, that's I mean, both a te an extraordinary testament of modern medicine, but also the, to go through those stages there, that the, you knew, you already knew about the cancer, mm. the, and then, what prompted you to get the extra testing? Did you pay for it? Did I understand that right? Um, so when um, when they do the biopsy of your tumour, they send that off for testing and it came back that it, it, was, it was a hormone positive cancer. And at that point, the recommendation is that you go and get tested for these uh, genetic mutations. But what it transpired is we didn't know that, you know, so I've, I've said in the chat as well that my parents have been doing biobank 20 to 30 years and none of none of those tests have happened in the process of that research so it turns out that my dad has BRCA2 and my mum has ATM now I'm not saying that Biobank have done anything wrong but had they been testing genes as well potentially I could have not gone through what I've gone through um, and there are there are just a couple of other things that I wanted to say that I think that we need to think about in this area um, and this could be something or nothing, but my surgeon said to me that there is an epidemic of breast cancer at the moment and that there are these geographical pockets. So Yorkshire and Scotland apparently are very high for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And I think that, you know, can we safely say that we have got enough resource, whether that's research, money, um, treatments in those areas, are those people disadvantaged because of where they live um, and the other thing that I want to say is um, so we found out my brother has BRCA2 and he's three years younger than me he's not married he um, you know at some point he's got to have a conversation with his future wife about children because they're not necessarily going to be able to go about it the normal way and the most devastating thing for me in my journey was the fertility. And I totally, totally like support what Lath has said about this lack of, of uh, research and attention in fertility, women's reproductive health. It's very much an afterthought in, in my journey. And it will be for my brother Max that at some, you know, like, and I've also said, you know, my husband and I have decided we're not testing our embryos because we're terrified that by testing them, we'll lose them. But then we're taking a huge risk. You know, they have a 50% chance of, of having these mutations. But I'm just counting on people like Rich and Mavis and Latha and Caroline that they are going to come up with a solution. But I think, I, I think there are still so many more questions than we, than we have answers. Thanks ever so much, Liz. The um, really appreciate your sharing that with us. Um, the I, I've just noticed the clock actually; it's just gone past um, seven thirty. Um, the so I should start. I should be wrapping up. Um, I really wanted to thank um, thank you all. Uh, thanks to Rich, Latha, and Mavis. Also, actually, to Andrew and Fliss for sharing their patient stories, um, as well as to to Caroline. Um, the, I think the, 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 the thing I've taken away from this conversation is, is we use the word difficult quite a lot, right? There's a lot of quite hard conversations that we have to have. I feel like the, the um, uh, Latha was quite optimistic about her ability to sort of bend her local infrastructure towards her research needs. But the, I feel like the, the um, big, the really big questions about how we, we dedicate resource, the ones that are raised by Fliss's case, for example, on, on reproductive health and um, are really tough. I feel, feel like the uh, BRCA is quite, an, uh, quite a sort of useful clarifying uh, point. We had a conversation, you know, it came up earlier that it's, it's, a, it's a mutation with, as Mavis pointed out, with 
um, which is uh, occurs more pre is more prevalent in particular uh, ethnic groups. And actually, that raises questions for us about prioritization um, and the intersection of you know disease and and social position. I think these are these are really really hard questions for for us to answer, and they're. They are political, right? Actually, in a funny sense. Uh, so, in the chat, you may he's not really said very much, but the, the, in fact, the the chief executive of, of Genomics England is is loitering. Um, who and he tweets as Chris underscore Wiggly. Um, um, in a sense, it's really in. A, it's not a question for Genomics England. Some of this stuff. This is a question for secretaries of state and elected officials who are going to have to sort of say, you know what? Actually, we haven't done enough on X or Y or Z. These are. This is a. We're going to have to just push resource away from these diseases to these ones, and I feel like it's not a it's not a thing that it's fair to ask anyone who's not answerable to the public to do. Um, accountability, which is a word that Latha used, I think, um, is actually the 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 hardest thing to do. So yeah, thanks ever so much, everyone, for coming. A, a really exciting, interesting chat as well. Um, I look forward to. We have another of these coming up. Um, and uh, we will pester you with, with details about that as well. We, um, we have an education summit next week, next Thursday. We have lots of other events um, on a range of topics. And I hope to see, see you all at more of those. Thank you ever so much and enjoy the sunshine.